from smack blasting to podcasting welcome to the sober junkies podcast my name's jacob neeson and i'm sam rad and today we are talking to ryan hampton uh, ryan is a recovering heroin addict and recovery advocate he is a former clinton white house staffer uh, his so- social media content reaches over a million people a week uh, he's been called by forbes magazine quote a social media powerhouse for all things addiction, recovery, and policy, end quote. Uh, Ryan was part of the core team that released the first ever U.S. Surgeon General's report on addiction. Uh, He's the founder of the Voices Project, and he also serves as an outreach lead for Facing Addiction, which is America's leading nonprofit dedicated to alleviating the U.S. addiction crisis. Ryan has been on HLN, His work has been featured in various online journals, including The Hill and Huffington Post. And his first book, titled American Fix, was released in August. So I um, definitely wasn't on a trajectory to become a heroin addict when I I was growing up. Uh, It's not something I aspired to be. It's not something that I even think was in the cards for me. Um, You know, I grew up in a a middle class home in South, sunny South Florida. Um, I had a pretty good childhood um, and, and was always interested in politics and community organizing. And I excelled at school and was in student government. Um, you know, I, I volunteered on political campaigns. I was a really, really weird kid. Um, you know, I, 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 I had jobs with local political campaigns as I got into high school. And um, as a result of that, you know, I ended up moving to Washington, D.C., uh, in my college years, you know, I, I had had like my dabs of like college partying and high school partying, um, but nothing that was really out of the ordinary. Um, yes, in college, I drink too much probably, but so did everybody else around me. Um, but my journey was, was much different, um, you know, than my classmates and the people that I grew up with. I got a job at the White House and I started working at the White House in the Clinton administration in 1999. Um, after President Clinton left office, uh, I got a job working for one of the national parties on the 2004 presidential campaign. And really, my deep dive into addiction began in the early 2000s. Um, nothing was really out of the ordinary, uh, but really what was the, the, the turning point for me was in 2003, I was uh, on a hike on a, on a trail called the Billy Go Trail which is right outside of Washington, D.C. with my, my roommate at the time. And I slipped and I, I fractured my knee and I hurt my ankle really bad. And I was taken to uh, what's known as kind of like a minute clinic, kind of like a, 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 a emergency room setting, but it was like an urgent care center. And the doctor there prescribed me a high-grade opioid called hydromorphone, which is also known uh, is Dilaudid. It was the generic form of Dilaudid. And I took those pills and she told me, she said, you know, you're going to want to get this checked out. You're, you're going to want to get an MRI. Um, but I never really got that MRI. I never, you know, I kind of walked off uh, the injury that I had. Um, but what I did do was go back for more pain pills. Uh, and I was given a higher script every single time. Um, what started as an in- injury, like quickly turned into drug dependence and then turned into addiction. The perfect storm of this scenario, though, and, it, it, you know, it, I, I wish I would have known. I wish my family would have known. I wish this country would have known. I wish we all would have known, uh, you know, what was going on back then in the early 2000s that we do now. Um, but we didn't. I had moved back to Florida shortly after that injury and went to see my primary care physician and was referred to a a pain management clinic um, to manage the pain. Uh, This was in late 2003, early 2004. And if you know anything about South Florida and the landscape of South Florida in the early 2000s, it's really where the pill mill crisis was born. Uh, Unscrupulous doctors, unscrupulous pharmacies, uh, lots of doctor shopping, And I ended up at one of those um, in late 2003, early 2004, and walked out of a physician's office with more pills than I can even care to remember. Um, 
it took a downward spiral from there uh, for a few years following. I um, started getting into the doctor shopping scene, um, needed more and more and more and more. Um, I was working with doctors. Doctors knew what I was doing. I had doctors that ended up becoming kind of pseudo drug dealers. They were using themselves uh, and quickly fell into that uh, kind of bottomless pit of drug seeking, um, which at this time had become full fledged addiction. Now, you know, call me naive. I did not know um, at the time, or I had not made the connection between the Oxycontin, the pills that I was taking and physical dependence. Um, it was about two years in from using the medications. I was on a pretty consistent flow of them. Um, I had never really run out. I was for the most part using them as prescribed. This was before I started the doctor shopping. And I was sitting in my office one day working on a, on a US Senate campaign actually in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I had run out of my prescription about 14, 13, 14 hours prior. And when I ran out, I thought, it's okay, I'll just get an appointment tomorrow or the next day. Um, you know, everything will be fine. Um, and if you know anything, you know, about opioid addiction, what it does to the brain, you know that that kind of 13, 14 hour window is really when withdrawals start to, to kick in heavy. And I was sitting at my desk and uh, I started sweating and getting really sick throughout the day. Um, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with me? And I went into the bathroom, you know, splash water on my face, try to pull myself together. And I looked at myself and I'm like, could this have anything to do with the pills? Could this have, you know, it, it's just kind of, uh, you know, uh, weird that this is happening when I'm out of my medication, went back to my desk and Googled like all the side effects. What does withdrawal look like? You know, started finding out, you know, more, you know, doing my own research, and I realized at that moment I had a problem. Um, but what I didn't do was say, oh, my God, I've got a problem, you know, with these pills. Let me go get help. Um, I figured out and I hustled my way to get more. Um, and it continued that way for, for quite some time. Now, while I was on the pills, things started to kind of gradually decline in my life, uh, started to lose jobs, started to kind of start to, to see some of the consequences um, that we all know too well on addiction, uh, spending a lot of money, uh, you know, missing, uh, bills, car payments. Um, I think I had my first eviction during that time frame, and, uh, it just continually, continuously progressed. Now, Florida kind of realized it had a problem. You know, that was what they called the Oxycontin Express between Kentucky, you know, I-95 and the turnpike between Kentucky all the way down to Miami. Um, people used to come from Kentucky, come from West Virginia, get their medications in South Florida, and then drive them back up. Um, well, I was already in South Florida. And, you know, this kind of hit the radar of the state of Florida, law enforcement, um, different medical association groups, and they pushed for what they thought would be the solution uh, to stopping this, which was instituting these things called uh, PDMPs, which is uh, physician monitoring databases, you know, the little databases where you walk into the doctor's office and they can tell how many doctors you've seen, you know, what your prescriptions were for, what date it was on, where it was filled, all that stuff. Um, I was unaware, I was aware it was being put into place. I was unaware that it was active when I went to one of my doctors in 2008. Um, and I was clearly, I mean, by this time I was, I was really, really heavy in, um, went into the doctor's office to get my prescription, uh, was in withdrawal at the time. You know, people ask, you know, how is it that you, you have this, you know, descent from working in the White House to being homeless on the streets and addicted to heroin? Um, well, it was progressive, but the kick into heroin was when I went into the doctor's office that day, uh, expecting to pick up my script, uh, only to be called a junkie, um, called a drug seeker, you know, by the doctor, pulled, you know, my entire record pulled up you know, kicked out of her office and told that if I ever showed back up, I'd be arrested. Um, again, as naive as this may sound, I did not know. I mean, I was, I was 20, you know, 27 years old. I didn't know what rehab looked like. I didn't know what recovery looked like. I'd only really heard of AA and NA and 12 step groups and, and, and things like that. Um, in a very minimal fashion through, you know, 
television or movies or whatnot, I really didn't know where to go. Um, and my brain had been really hijacked at that point. Um, I walked out of the doctor's office and I wasn't the only one this was happening to. And there was a heroin dealer, uh, multiple heroin dealers who were there right on the street corner, um, you know, saying, Hey, you need to get well, here's a way to get well. And, and, you know, off from there, um, quick, quick descent into heroin addiction. Um, and with it came the homelessness and the hustling and the living on the street and panhandling and, um, you know, the hopelessness, um, all of that, it all came with it. Um, you know, multiple bouts, you know, South Florida really wasn't the bastion for addiction treatment at the time. There was a lot of, uh, interesting things that were going on down there. I got caught in the trap door of it, whether it was kind of an unscrupulous sober home, um, really expensive rehab that wasn't providing any type of treatment or pathway out of recovery, out of addiction, um, and had several attempts at that. Um, but, you know, due to some luck and some circumstance, um, that was by no meaning of my own, um, you know, in the, the night before Thanksgiving, 2014, um, I had, I was living in California at the time I was on the streets. Um, you know, I, I had a shot at getting some help and I took it. Um, and I've been, uh, sober ever since that time. Your book states that, uh, your friend Tyler, um, passed away in a sober living house, correct? Yep. Um, yep. and so you kind of want to change the, the laws and, and how, you know, sober living houses are ran. And I personally, um, am just in the middle of opening up a sober living house. And for me myself, I was very unhappy with how the Oxford group runs it. They kind of just, there's like the self governing process and, you know, relationships can take place in some of the houses. And I want this to be as as structured as possible. And so not only have I went to school for AODA counseling, but my girlfriend and the partner for my house uh, just finished her bachelor's degree in psych, and now she's in her master's program for counseling. And I really want to make sure that this place is as safe as possible, because that's really the end goal of all of this is to keep people safe and, and I, I just don't want what happened to your friend Tyler to happen in my house. Can you talk about uh, the new bills or legislation sure. that's, that's me, happening? Uh, let me, yeah. And let me talk a little bit about Tyler. So, and, and sober living, um, you know, I, it's, it's funny. So I'm actually in Austin, Texas today for the, uh, the National Association of State Housing Agencies, which is the heads of all the different ho affordable housing agencies for all 50 states um, opening it up tomorrow, their plenary session to actually talk about recovery housing and the importance of recovery housing uh, for people who are seeking recovery from addiction. You know, I had been to treatment well over half a dozen times. I had been in multiple sober livings in Florida and in California, um, and I couldn't stay sober. You know, and I didn't really realize until I started diving into the advocacy and diving into the data and the science and the published data and, and the studies that are out there, that there is such a high linkage, there's such a high correlation between having stable, um, safe and qualified sober living recovery residents and maintaining long term recovery. It, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, what is it that I should do to get sober? Like, what's the most important part of kind of that recovery process? To me, and in my opinion, it is sober living. It is being able to be there because it is an affordable way to be in a peer community uh, where people are supporting you, lifting you up. It's safe. Um, you know, it, 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 it contributes to higher recovery rates. We know that. In 2016, our former Surgeon General Vivek Murthy published the first ever um, study, Surgeon General's Report on Alcohol, Drugs, and Health. In that study, it stated that if you can get someone past year five, so if they can get up to the first five years of their recovery, um, they have an 85% chance of sustaining recovery for the rest of their life. So why don't we try and get people to those first five years, past those first five years? Recovery housing is a big part of it. Now, I recovery housing, sober living saved my life. I happened to stumble into a good one for the first time in my life uh, in 2014, and it saved my life. If it weren't for that home, I wouldn't be alive today. 
uh, it was more important to my journey than treatment. Um, there are friends of mine who are living phenomenal, fascinating lives in recovery today who didn't have money to go to treatment, but they had money to go to a recovery house to, to, to get detox uh, and to find their own pathway um, that led them to purpose and, and, and uh, you know, a sustained life in recovery. Tyler was my sponsee. He was my first sponsee. Great kid, 24 years old. Um, he was an alumni of the same treatment center that I went to. And uh, I had been working with him and he started uh, living at this recovery house, this sober living in Pasadena. It was charging, you know, upwards of $1,500 cash a month. It had been around, awkwardly enough, for well over 10 years, was known in the area as an established sober living, as, as somewhere that, you know, people had propped up and marketed as a good place to go to. Um, but for $1,500 a month, all you were really getting uh, was someone to sign a meeting card. Uh, and like all the ramen you could ever eat, you know, I mean, food was included and that was it. Um, yeah, there's food, there was but no, no Narcan apparently there was no Narcan. There was also no, um, you know, there, there, there was no push, uh, to help people get job training or find employment, um, you know, or find, you know, healthcare supports, um, about 80% of the house were people who were in recovery from heroin or opioids. And we know that overdose people are at the highest highest risk of overdose in their early recovery if they're coming off of opioids um, and abstinence based, um, which this house was. Um, you know, people relapse. You know, but now with the, the 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 surge in fentanyl and car fentanyl, which has made its way to California, um, the heroin's different uh, and it's deadly. So Tyler got high, um, came home one night. Um, told the sober living manager he was high, uh, told him he didn't know what to do. And uh, the, the, the manager of the house said, you know what, just go, go sleep it off. Stay, in the, stay on the couch downstairs in the living room, sleep it off. And uh, you know, we'll deal with it in the morning. So she wakes, uh, the manager wakes up at 6 a.m. in the morning, goes downstairs. Tyler's blue in the face. Uh, he's breathing, but he's hardly breathing. Um, she recognized there was an issue. Um, he was alive. Uh, there was no Narcan on hand. Uh, she didn't even know how the basic responses, uh, to, to what to do, um, uh, when there is an overdose. So she panicked, she called 911. Um, and by the time 911 showed up, uh, Tyler was dead, you know, and, um, that angered me. What angered me even more though, was when I learned the story the next day and I said, well, he's paying all this money. You guys have been around for a long time. Why was there no Narcan? Even if there wasn't Narcan on hand, why aren't you trained on how to respond to an overdose? You know, you know, there's rescue breathing. There's things that you can do um, that can bridge someone's life until, until the paramedics arrive. Uh, and their response to me, the house's response to me, well, you know, it's, that's all nice, Ryan, but it, the real sad story here is that Tyler just didn't want to get sober. And that, really made me angry um, because regardless of whether or not he was using her high, you know, that house should have been a safe place for him. And at the minimum, the staff at the house should have been trained on how to respond to an overdose. Look, you don't send a diabetic to an assisted living facility um, that doesn't carry insulin or know how to deal with a diabetic attack or a coma. And then if someone dies because there's no insulin on site, you say, well, the, the real sad story here is that your friend just wanted that piece of cake. You know, I mean, that that's basically the same thing that they were saying to me. Um, and it really ticked me off. And so I started to do some research and, and talk to some policy leaders and look at the California laws and realize that there is no regulation for sober livings in California. There are no standards. Basically anybody or their mother could open up a home, uh, call it a sober living, put a, you know, slap a, a poster on the front door that you know, says they're open for business and that's that. And while I support peer recovery communities and peer recovery housing, and I don't think we should get into the space of licensure because we should keep these as peer run facilities or peer run homes, there should be certain protections, consumer protections for people who are at a critical point in their early recovery to ensure that it is a safe place for them to live. 
it also can help us, you know, delineate the good from the bad. Um, and we wrote a bill. Um, we got our state senator on board. We got a bunch of assembly members on board. We got it through committee. You know, we're in the most liberal state in the nation, California, that should be the most progressive. And by the time the bill was about to pass the appropriations committee, um, our governor threatened to veto if we didn't cut all the sober li living language out. So even though there have been multiple deaths in the state of California um, due to people dying in sober living homes that are not qualified to be treating or, or supporting people with substance use disorder or addiction problems, um, the state of California said that they are not going to do anything about it. We did get a ban on patient brokering. We are going to be bringing back the sober living bill next year. Um, but it was a lot of um, bad providers, kind of bad housing providers that have a lot of money um, that caused a lot of noise and didn't want to be certified. You know, they knew that they would be out of the game if they had to start getting people well. Um, you know, and I know I, I don't want to like sound like a conspiracy theorist, but you know, there's a lot of money in keeping people sick. You know, there's a lot of money in making sure that people are returning to treatment multiple times. 70% of, um, on average, at, at least in Southern California, which is a huge hub for addiction treatment, 70% of the clientele that comes through addiction treatment in Southern California are return customers. So if you get people better and you get them into stable homes and a lot of these sober livings had these reciprocal, reciprocal contracts, uh, you know, had these reciprocal contracts with, with sober livings, um, they're losing business. Um, so we're doing everything we can from, from the advocacy side to help stop that. Now, the good news is, is that we have been able to pass federal legislation, H.R. 4684, which for the first time ever on the federal level creates standards for sober living homes. It is still up to the states to make it law, but the federal government is going to publish standards and say this is what a recovery resident should look like. There should be Narcan. There should be overdose response training. There should be transparency um, when there's financial transactions, you know, um, you know, different levels of care. Uh, again, not creating a licensure, but just some basic guardrails to make sure people are safe and as importantly, are not taken advantage of. You know, I've been through multiple, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been through multiple sober livings in Florida and, and Southern California, where I'd go in and I'd hand $900 to somebody, you know, for a month, for a month's uh, rent, uh, wouldn't sign any papers. And I may be, you know, damn two weeks, three weeks sober and forget to make my bed one morning. And I come home from work and all my stuff's packed up and it's put out on the street corner. Right. You know, um, and, 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 and they use the, the, they, they use the excuse that like, well, it's structured living. And if you don't, you know, live right, then you have no place to stay here. That's not how we treat people, especially right. when that's not understood from the front end. And then if you look at the business side of it, which I've been able to kind of understand now these days, you know, that's just freeing up another bit. So that, that, that operator has now turned, you know, 900 what 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 should be $900 a month times 3 because they're probably going to flip that bed two or three times that month. Right. That's what we need to get rid of. Right. I yeah. I couldn't agree more. So th there's obviously a huge distinction as you said between sober living and quality sober living and I've I've seen it personally. I mean, I've spent I think close to 3 years of my 20s in different sober living houses in Prescott, Arizona and here in Wisconsin. And I mean, I think one thing that this legislation you were just talking about federally, one thing it does is it, you know, makes it able for people to prosecute this patient brokering. So like the place I was in in Arizona, it's now shut down. And what was happening there, I believe, I don't know if this is 100 percent correct. The New York Times did a piece on it, but the guy running it essentially was buying ACA plans for all of the clients like top tier ACA plans. that's happening all and that's happening all that's still happening around right. the country. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's and, disgusting. Right. And especially in, in Florida too, which is, you know, along with Prescott and I think Minneapolis, you know, the per capita highest sober living, you know, congested areas. There was actually an episode recently of American greed, this MSNBC show about this guy in Florida 
I mean, the guy became a multimillionaire and essentially he just Kenny, had this. Kenny Chapman. Yeah, Kenny right. Chapman. Yeah. Right. He got yeah. some yeah. insanely long sentence, which, which seems fitting. And he was basically just like, it was a prostitution ring. And he was basically just like supplying these kids with drugs so he could, you know, bill insurance for, uh, you know, more money. It was like $5,000 a UA. And yeah, obviously some kind of regulation, just like if you don't regulate a, a massive corporation it's going to run amok and destroy the economy i mean if you just let these kinds of businesses do whatever they want there's going to be just unethical and cynical people that you know just use it to make money at the cost of human lives um, you know and you, you bring up an important point though because it's like and th this is why i do the work that i'm doing you know any other health care issue in this country that that if it were treated this way um, to such a blind eye, you know, people would be outraged. And, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter remains that, you know, 200 people will die today because of opioids, 350 people total, if you want to include alcohol and other drugs. We're in the midst of this country's most, you know, devastating public health crisis of this generation. Um, yet, we're not getting solutions quick enough. And when we do have good solutions on the table, people are looking a blind eye. And it really goes back to the fact that stigma and shame and silence and, and, and discrimination and prejudice, you know, against people who are in recovery or people who are suffering from addiction is alive and well. We are looked at as a second class disposable class of people. You know, um, we're, we're not looked at as worthy of saving. And that's why the recovery community, the recovery movement is so important. There's 23 million Americans, 23 million Americans who are living in long-term recovery in the United States. There's another 22 million or so who are currently suffering, most of them in silence right now, who need help right now. You're looking at about 45 million Americans. Now, the math on that would be about one in three American households that are directly impacted. But because people are silent, because of that shame, we're not seen as a constituency. We're not seen as a constituency of consequence. So there's all these nonprofits, there's all this great work going on, but there's very little community organizing going on. And, and kind of my hypothesis that I wrote about in the book, um, but I've also seen come to life around the country, is that if those who are willing and able to talk about their recovery, to show what recovery looks like, to get involved. If they get involved, if they register to vote, if they talk to legislators, if they offer nothing more, it, it, it can be as simple as just their lived experience, what they've seen, what they've been through, what's worked for them. Um, if they show their faces and raise their hands and say that we're gonna get involved and we're gonna become active members of our civic engagement and civic society, people will start to pay attention. You know, you look at the history of kind of social justice movements in the country, in the United States, particularly when it comes to HIV AIDS and other health crisis or the LGBT movement or civil rights or women's suffrage. I mean, those were all marginalized groups that had been discriminated against and seen as less than. But when they showed their political willpower and they showed that they were taxpayers and they were voters and that they could run for office and they were business owners and they were neighbors and employers, when people saw that, they started paying attention to them. So I know that, you know, for me, when I, when I got public about my recovery, when I started talking about it, it was a very personal decision. And it wasn't a decision that was guided by, I think, uh, the misinterpretation of the anonymity of, of, of the 12 steps. Uh, it, was, it was basically to protect myself. Um, that was my hesitation before I came out. Right. When I came out and I, I was in a good place to do it, I was able to do it. It changed the whole game for me. And I think there's a lot of people out there um, who want to talk about their recovery, who want to get involved. Um, you know, not everybody can. I mean, and that's why we do what we do, because people can still lose their jobs. They can still lose their kids. They can still lose their homes. They can still be denied life insurance. Um, they can still be denied medical care. I mean, that's why the, the ones of us who can talk about it need to talk about it and talk about it loudly. Um, anonymity, if it's okay to, to just address for, for one second. I always thought when I entered my 12-step program, 
I always thought anonymity, and this is how it was kind of passed down to me through the ages, meant that I couldn't go out and talk about my recovery. It meant that I needed to stay silent. It, mean, it meant that I don't talk about it at work or, or outside of my 12-step group. And that was kind of this cultural uh, uh, teaching, <laughs> I guess you could say, that, that was passed down through the ages and kind of got muddy, like, like a bad game of telephone gone wrong. Since entering the, the new adv recovery advocacy movement, I have spent a lot of time studying the, you know, the, the, the genesis of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson's story, Marty Mann's story, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, um, mutual aid groups. Anonymity was never intended to mean don't talk about your recovery. Never. Bill Wilson, even in 1972, testified before the United States Congress and identified as an alcoholic and talked about the need for addiction treatment, right? He went out and he advocated. Marty Mann, who is the first lady, known as the first lady of Alcoholics Anonymous, who was Bill Wilson's sponsee, founded the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, which is the nation's first advocacy organization for people who suffer from addiction and alcoholism. There is a historical precedent for what we are doing today that was started by the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, anonymity, in my opinion, in my, in my interpretation, means I don't go out and say that I'm a member of a specific fellowship or a specific 12-step group. I don't go out and identify other people's recovery. Um, you know, I can, it means that I should be able to walk into any 12-step meeting in the United States and just be Ryan addict or Ryan alcoholic and leave everything else at the door. What it does not mean is that I can't go out into my community and talk about recovery and show what recovery looks like and push for more access to recovery and recovery oriented solutions. And it's and 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 it and it has been hard to communicate that to the to, to the community. But I think that we are seeing kind of a cultural shift there. We're seeing a younger generation of people in recovery who are more open and willing to talk about their recovery, mostly due to the fact because it's this younger generation who's watching their friends and their roommates and their loved ones and their, 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 their family members die from overdoses. Uh, and they know that they need to do something. Right. Yeah. It's refreshing to hear somebody with a platform as big as yours, um, you know, speak that way about the tradition and perhaps the misinterpretation of it, because, I mean, Jake and I both have gotten a lot of pushback in 12 step communities, um, just for speaking in general in any way about 12-step programs and their possible downsides and parts of the book that may be unhelpful. And, I mean, if we can't talk about these things, obviously the stigma just gets perpetuated. And right. uh, the, the other point you talked about, um, it's interesting because as far as the stigma goes among such like a big part of the populace, so politically speaking, I would say I'm – a liberal, you know, centrist. I mean, I voted for Hillary. I voted for Obama. I think the left is confused about some things. On this topic yep. in particular, the right just seems utterly confused. And I mean, most of what I'm seeing is just this, you know, let them die. Um, well, I, I'm going to stop. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm going to stop you there, though, because it, it, it yes and no, it's it's both. So Jerry Brown, who's a liberal Democrat in California, was threatening a veto of a bill that would provided would have provided consumer protections to people in recovery. The state of Nevada is having a hard time getting funding for peer recovery supports through a Democratic controlled legislature. Right. I've seen a Republican sheriff in Chesterfield County, Virginia, who was on the Trump Pence committee, who has the most innovative, progressive forward thinking approach to addressing addiction in the criminal justice system and is reducing recidivism by 84% because he's treating people who come through his jail as people, not as criminals. And I have a hard time getting that program instituted in my you know, blue background of Los Angeles, California. That being said, my Congresswoman is a, is a Democrat who helped us get 4684 through through Congress to provide the protections on a, on a federal level for sober living homes. So I've seen good come from the right. You know, President Trump and I am a liberal Democrat. I voted for Hillary. I worked for Bill, you know, but President Trump, you know, although he's not doing enough and a lot of his thinking is just completely off kilter uh, when it comes to this issue, he not has provided more issue. funding. 
not just this issue, but 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 I'm a, I'm a single issue person. Right. Has provided you know five times as much funding as Obama did. Obama really didn't even touch this issue until the last year of his administration. So there there is an argument to be made that it's not necessarily about red or blue or Republican or Democrat. What we're seeing is that when policy leaders and I've seen the shift happen, I've been in the room when it's happened. When policy leaders have families and have people in recovery who are sitting there and talking to them and pushing for solutions and helping to craft this policy, we get good policy, right? We get good policy when we're involved. Everybody wants to solve the opioid crisis. It is, it is in the top three, it is pulling in the top three national issues when it comes to, to what's on voters' minds. Legislators, senators, congressmen, they want to go home to their districts and say, we are bringing some sort of solution to this crisis. We are going to end it. We know that if we don't take a radical disruptive approach right now to ending the crisis, we're looking down the barrel of another half a million people dead within the next 10 years. Nobody wants that to happen. Um, But we get bad policy when we're not involved. Decisions are made about us every single day without us because we're not at the table. And why is that? Because a lot of reasons, stigma, anonymity, people don't think it's their place. It is your place. We are the only ones who can really push for a change. It is up to us. Like, look at the LGBT movement, right? Like, people were dying in the masses of AIDS, of, of, of HIV and AIDS. People were terrified to come out of the closet as gay. Not until the gay community started, you know, coming out and saying who they were and family members were talking about their gay son or their their their, their gay daughter or brother um, and saying that they weren't ashamed of it. And they created this unified constituency. And we realized that there are LGBT Americans all over the country and that they're a huge population. You know, we didn't need every gay man to take to the streets in the 90s during ACT UP uh, to push for solutions. We only needed a thousand or two and those thousand or two got out and they got vocal and they got angry and they got involved and they they banged down legislators doors. And here we are, you know, three decades later with uh, gay marriage, we billions and billions of dollars that goes uh, every year to HIV AIDS research. HIV is now a manageable chronic health condition that is not a death sentence. I mean, that is all the authentic and organic outcome of advocacy by that community. We are at that same moment for addiction, recovery, the opioid crisis. Um, it, it is up to us. We have to get involved. We, we know what to do. We've seen it in history. Um, the history books have been written on other health crises and, and, and social justice issues. We know what to do. There is a prescription for this. We just need to do it. Right. So part of the fix to uh, solve this opioid crisis is to speak up. And, and myself, I really just want the idea that uh, prisons and jails is not treatment. Uh, I was just on the news recently about this. And and I feel like it's, it's extremely unfortunate that we have these drug laws in place. And I mean, felonies are attached to people and it, it reinforces this stigma. Let's talk about the, the drug laws specifically. Do you feel like uh, there needs to be some kind of change to that or... Yeah, I mean, there needs to be a. I, 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 I am not for legalization of drugs. I am for the decriminalization of drugs. Why not legalization? I, I just, I, I'm not there yet. Um, I tend to, to, to lean that way, um, but I'm still, I'm still studying it. Let's just put it that way. I, 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 I am leaning in that favor, but kind of in the place until I get there. I'm all for decriminalization. I don't think people should be going to prison. I don't think people should be going to jail. I think people should be offered treatment instead of jail time. Um, I think we've seen some really fascinating results with with problem solving courts in this country um, that are diverting people from criminal sentences and getting them the help that they need so that their their uh, their records are not you know tarnished for the rest of their lives for employment or or or, or housing or anything like that. Um, you know, drug policy in this country is messed up. We know it is messed up. It is all a result of Reagan's war on drugs. Uh, you know, President Clinton had a hand in it. We know that. Um, I think that that those leaders, though, I mean, we're looking, you know, 20, 30, 40, you know, 20, 30, 35 years ago, um, those policy leaders, uh, those White House administrations were really kind of acting under the information they had at the time. And now we know what a bad decision that was. Um, 
something definitely has to change and we need to look at a different way of addressing this. Um, it needs to be more dealt with though, uh, as a health issue, um, rather than a justice issue, you know, dealing with this in the criminal justice system, we have the stats, we've got the data, we, we, we you know, the studies have been done was ineffective. Um, so while I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards legalization, um, I'm still kind of, you know, the jury is still out on that for me right now. Uh, I'm 100% for decriminalization. The main opposition I've seen to, you know, decriminalization, like, you know, kind of the Portugal idea or even total legalization yep. is basically just the religious right and this idea that it's somehow immoral on principle to alter your own consciousness. Unless I mean, you might, yeah. I mean, you might see that with some individual legislators and policymakers. I, 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 yes and no. So, I mean, Ohio now maybe legalization, you know, maybe, and that, that's why it's kind of like, you know, kind of walking the line on that issue right now, but maybe legalization, you see that, but criminal justice reform, let's just, let's take a step back. And, and, and just get talk about criminal justice, criminal justice reform, offering people treatment instead of jail, right? Uh, keeping people out of the criminal justice system, giving them diversion options, problem solving courts. I, I mean, I was as fascinated as anyone. Um, in Ohio, there's a ballot initiative right now um, that looks like it's going to pass in November um, that really pushes people towards getting help, state funded help, as opposed to locking them up. And guess who the primary funder of the initiative is, along with George Soros and, and, and other you know, progressive leaning groups, the Christian coalition. Right. The Christian coalition has, has put a ton of money into this initiative because they, they're, they're towing the line that it's keeping families together. Um, so Christian right, religious right, uh, right wingers, yeah, there's some that are absolutely nuts and are you know, never gonna see us as equals. Um, but I try to, to, I, I try, I shy away from pitting this issue into one or the other Republicans are better or Democrats are better because the, you know, when you look at the whole, I mean, I, I, I don't know the specifics of your community and your state. Um, but when you look at the whole, all 50 states and some of the work that's being done on a federal level, um, there's solutions coming from all sides and there's also problems coming from all sides. Um, you know, so I mean, and, and, and Arguably, in the most polarizing political environment that we've had in decades in this country, the opioid crisis and addiction and recovery is probably the single most unifying political issue on the table right now. And we should take advantage of that. That segues nicely into this. One of the last topics I wanted to touch on, and then if Jake has anything else. So I know that you started your journey with Suboxone this time, and you were on it for, I think, just a few weeks or something like that. And it yep. actually worked for you. You got off it. You've been sober, what, three, four years now, I believe? Almost almost four years. I was on um, buprenorphine for the first about 10 weeks of my of my recovery, um, which I'll say if I hadn't been on it, I'd probably be dead today. Um, and I had to kind of sneak my way to be on it. I had a doctor who was who was keeping me on it while I was on in treatment. Um, but I ultimately was discharged from treatment because they found out that I was on Suboxone. <laughs> and uh, I had a really hard time finding a recovery house too uh, that would take me on it. So um, right. I think there's a lot of, I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of issues with Matt, most of them coming from within, within the recovery community. To kind of prove your point on the left versus right topic. So, I mean, I think it was a year or two ago um, where Trump's former health secretary who now is fired or quit like most of the Tom Price people around yeah. him yeah. said something about, yeah. you know, Suboxone and these maintenance drug just being trading one addiction for another. And yeah. I mean, I tend to agree with him generally on that statement. But what I saw from the left was just all of this. Well, it's coming from a right wing administration, so it must be wrong. Like, you know, this idea that this no matter what they say, like even if Trump did something amazing for this problem, I could see a lot of people just based on partisanship. So. Yeah, I mean that's like where I'll where I will disagree with you on. So we're, I used to have that opinion, um, that it is trading one drug for another, right? Early in recovery, uh, until I lost one of my really good friends because he was shamed in an AA meeting 
uh, for being on Suboxone went off of it. He died two days later. Um, it is not up to me to judge someone else's recovery pathway. We're in the midst of the most deaths we've ever had, and it's only getting worse. <laughs> People, the death toll is only going up. The overdose numbers are only going up. We've seen the data. We have seen, we have seen what evidence-based practices look like. We have seen that Suboxone and Methadone can be a viable pathway for some people into finding sustained recovery, such as myself. Um, and, 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 and Patrick Kennedy, I'll, I'll point out as an example, who was on Suboxone for three years. He just celebrated seven years in recovery. The first three years of it, he was on Suboxone, right? And he's like one of the most effective advocates that we've got out there. Um, smart guy. Uh, full of life, full of purpose, living an amazing life, just had two kids. I mean, we have seen where it has saved lives and it has helped, you know, heal families. Um, it is not for everybody, but abstinence isn't for everybody either. Like, and, 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 and I think the sooner that we can recognize that there are multiple pathways to finding recovery, some people do it with exercise. Some people do it with religion. Some people have something called uh, natural recovery. Um, do you know how many you know how many members how many people current day uh, identify as the best of the best data we have that identify in the United States as recovering from uh, a twelve step program or a member of a twelve step program? You're looking anywhere between two to three million people, right? So about two to three million people in the United States who are active members and are currently in a recovery program through twelve step. There's twenty three million Americans in the United States who are in long term recovery, right? 20 million people have found recovery other than the 12 steps. So we've got to get past this dogma that abstinence is the only way and that using Suboxone is just trading one drug for another. Because I don't know about you, but if somebody needs to stay on Suboxone to stay alive and to keep their seat and to find their way, their pathway into recovery, maybe it's six weeks, maybe it's nine weeks, maybe it's a year, maybe it's two years, maybe it's five years, but they're alive. I, I, I mean, just because someone's on Suboxone does not mean that they're not in recovery. It doesn't mean that they can't live a purposeful, purposeful life. It doesn't mean that they can't find a job. Um, Oh, I know. It, it, yeah, and to, but I mean, but it, but it can't. But it's also not a silver bullet, right? So I'm going to just follow that up that and, and tie that all in a bow for you. That we can't just prescribe our way out of the problem either. So if you're putting somebody on medication, they need to have recovery housing. They need to have peer supports. They need to have behavioral health care services. They can't just be taking a pill or a tab or whatever it is um, and doing nothing else. They have to work a recovery program too. Um, that's where we have the highest success rates for people who are on medication. Um, but we've got all, all I mean, th this thing is getting so bad. It, we all options have to be on the table right now. Right. And to clarify, I wasn't advocating against Suboxone or necessarily saying it's trading one drug for another, only that it is also physically addictive. And obviously, if something's going to cut the mortality rate down on that principle alone, it's a good idea. Now, I think Suboxone sure. is much more useful than methadone, too, and there should be a distinction there. Um, I mean, yep. I'm as against the dogma in AA, not only against maintenance drugs, but even antidepressants and things like that. They seem to think that God can cure any right. illness you might have, right. which is just lunacy. But I do think that quality of life long term when on a drug like Suboxone is diminished. And that, like you said, it shouldn't just be this like go to as far as I mean, but that's, stay but that's forever. like, but that's, but that also is kind of debunked. Like, so quality of life on long-term spot. I mean, like that's where like you and I, and like when I was kind of in that silo, that's what I saw. Um, and I'll email you some of the studies, but th th there is plenty of evidence out there that quality of life for people who are on well-managed Suboxone, who are participating in recovery programs, um, have increased quality of life. And, and at the end of the day, that's really how we should be qualifying recovery. For me, recovery is a quality of life issue, issue, quality of life spectrum. If your life isn't getting better, if you're on Suboxone and your life isn't getting better, then try something else. If you're abstinent and your life isn't getting better, then you know you, you need to be looking at that. I don't measure, like I don't measure recovery anymore with a yardstick 
based on a pathway or even based on just not using drugs. I mean, like it is a quality of life issue for me. Um, there's plenty of people out there, you know, who aren't using alcohol or drugs and their lives are still running amok. You know, I mean, it, 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 it is a quality of life issue. Quality of life standard, I would say. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, when I took methadone for a year and a half, my life sucked, but I was also still smoking a lot of weed and taking a lot of benzos. And well, there you go. Kind of program. So that, <laughs> that might, might, that might it might have not, it, it might have not been the methadone as much then. Sure. <laughs> well, good stuff, guys. Listen, yeah. I'd love, I'd love to come back on and, and, yeah. um, you know, anybody who wants to reach out to me, they can find me on social media, hit me up on my website, ryanhampton.org. Um, you know, uh, check out the book and, um, I'm yeah. around Yeah, it's and been... I appreciate you guys having me on. Great talking to you. And before you go, if you just want to tell our listeners what the, uh, voices project is and what yep. facing addiction is, and also like the title of your book, I think that'd be a good one. Sure. sure. The, um, title of the book's American fix inside the opioid addiction crisis and how to end it. You can find it at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, your local bookseller, um, Facing Addiction is a great organization, a national nonprofit that is working towards solutions to end the addiction crisis by engaging the recovery community. Um, we have over 700 partners from around the country um, that are working on a local level to push for more recovery-oriented solutions to the crisis. Uh, you could check them out at facingaddiction.org. The Voices Project is my nonprofit. Um, it is encouraging people to kind of check the shame at the door, tell their stories. Um, if you have a story to t- tell, go to ryanhampton.org. Uh, I welcome you to send it there. I will feature it. I will get it on social media. And I promise you that after you share that story, you're going to want to do more, which is my journey. It's this journey of what I call is journey of what's next. Uh, after you, you tell your story, you want to know how more you can be involved. Um, and we are Voices Project just entered into a very exciting uh, partnership with Facebook uh, where we are uh, going to be registering voters over the next two years and creating kind of that uh, constituency of consequence and identifying recovery-oriented voters and letting people know, you know, that, that we're not just this big mass of people out there, that we're also registered and we're organized. Um, so uh, you can check me out at any one of those places and uh, get in touch with me. Well, thanks for doing everything that you do and, and being an activist for others who don't necessarily have the same platform you do. Yeah. Thanks guys. Talk Thanks, to you Ryan. soon. Yeah. Talk to you later. You got it. Have a good one. Bye-bye.